I learned very early in my own investment uh, journey that property is a game of finance. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of investors focus purely on the property. That's the first thing they do. They start scrolling through realestate.com and, and domain and getting excited about the, the colour of the kitchen and the bathrooms. But uh, in my own experience, property is actually the last thing you consider. So I think the, the sleeper that a lot of people are, are not getting their heads around at the moment. Uh, welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Welcome to another episode of the Property Hub's Get Invested podcast. I just wanted to jump in again and to let you know that today we're running another special episode where the tables have been turned yet again and I'm on the receiving end of more great questions. After interviewing Dominic Pesky here on Get Invested back on episode 283, which was released on about the 3rd of July this year, I was privileged for him to return the serve and join him as a guest on his Wealthy podcast. And given the relevance of the topics of our great discussion, we thought you'd get a lot out of it again by listening today. Dom's a good interviewer, so this episode is full of useful insights on property, investing and finance. During our great chat, we give you a market update on what we're seeing in the market and how it's informing our property actions. We reveal where we see the biggest opportunities to invest around the country and why, along with our thoughts on what's likely to happen with property going into 2024. I also unpack my investment philosophy, as well as the best moves I've made in property and what I've learned from them. And we round out the discussion with a rundown on mistakes I've made that have informed my decisions moving forward, concluding with suggestions for new investors and homeowners so they won't F up their new and next purchase. So there's stacks of gold to glean from our engaging chat. But before we get into it, I've got another very small and special favour to ask you. If you've ever liked or enjoyed any of the videos or podcasts that we've released, wherever you enjoy watching or listening to Get Invested, can you please help us by hitting the subscribe button now? It helps the Property Hub platform and the livelihoods of our entire support team that all work really hard to bring you the shows every week, much more than you'll ever know. And the bigger the Property Hub gets, the bigger the guests get. And for every new subscription, you'll also be helping to make the world a better place. Because by helping each other, we're also helping those less fortunate that have no voice and have no choice, as we donate a day's worth of life-saving water to families in Tigray in Ethiopia through B1G1 or Buy One Give One. So thanks in advance. Remember to always get invested in your future and enjoy my great chat with Dom Neski. Introducing Bushy Martin, the founder of Know How Property, author of award-winning books, The Freedom Formula and Get Invested, and regular commentator of property and finance on all good news channels. Now, with over 20 years of active investor experience, Bushy has helped 1,700 plus buyers secure over $600 million in property and is rec recognized as a top 10 property specialist and mentor of the year uh, finalist. Bushy is a veteran of this space and a mountain of knowledge. I wanted to get Bushy on the show because we talk a lot about different markets. We talk about um, property management. We talk about um, talk to real estate agents. Now, at his core, Bushy is a finance expert. And, you know, we were just having a chat before we got on the show. And I said, mate, we have to stop because you're saying so many good things. I want our viewers and listeners to hear it. Bushy, wait, welcome to the channel. Welcome to the show. Awesome, Dom. I've uh, been really looking forward to catching up, mate. I really enjoyed our conversation recently on the, the Get Invested podcast as part of a, a property hub network that I'm a part of. And uh, I love your enthusiasm, your passion, and what you're doing to assist uh, investors at, at all levels around the place, Dom. So I uh, love uh, talking all things property with people who have that, that same amount of energy and commitment to helping others to do the right thing. Thanks, mate. And you know, likewise, you've got a you've got a lot of really good work happening in behind the scenes. And one thing that I really appreciate is your commitment to the finance piece. 
because uh, as we just discussed, you know, a lot of property investors get hell bent on the property, but the piece of real estate only works as, as good as the finance piece. And um, it sounds crazy because you think, well, a good piece of real estate is a good piece of real estate. But if the funding isn't done correctly, that can undo that piece of real estate and your whole, whole portfolio. And I used to be a financial planner back in the day. And one of the pieces of advice that I got from my mentor was, don't fuck with your client's cash flow. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's so, so true. What the problems that you see with people is if their cash flow um, not being quite right. And if you can't hold on to the investment, if it's not structured right, it's it's drama, 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 drama. So, you know, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, some great points you've made there straight up, Dom. Uh, you know, as I was saying uh, in the green room, uh, I, I learned very early in my own investment uh, journey that property is a game of finance and uh, unfortunately a lot of investors focus purely on the property that's the first thing they do they start scrolling through realestate.com and and domain and getting excited about the the color of the kitchen and the bathrooms but uh, in my own experience property is actually the last thing you consider you've got to get all the other ducks in a row and a very important part of that is the finance piece the way you structure the the finance uh, the capacity that you can achieve with finance just as an example dom there's about 40 odd lenders that you can tap into into in the residential space here in australia there's about 2000 different loan solutions and across those there's uh, over a 55 percent variation on how much you can borrow now that i i've often say that most people when they think about finance they think about one thing and that's interest rate well, the interest rate is just the tip of the iceberg because the most limited resource that any property investor has, whether whether you're an investor or a homeowner, actually, is your capacity. And uh, we, we've seen over the last 12 months in particular where capacities are really uh, under threat because uh, a lot of people don't know that for every 1% rise in the interest rates, your borrowing capacity drops by about 100 grand on the on the average loan. So that that means that we've seen uh, in excess of $400,000 shaved off people's capacity in the last 12 months. Uh, so you re really need to get clever about uh, how you structure it, what you're buying the property in in terms of the entity, because that also affects the financing component of the uh, situation. And then make sure that you're tapping into a lender who has policies that are going to allow you to maximise that capacity way beyond the other. Because you know, a 55% variation is the difference between uh, buying a $500,000 property and a seven fifty dollars to $800,000 property. And if they both grow at the same rate over time, you're going to end up with a much more significant nest egg at the at the end of the journey. So you know, finance is key. And the other thing that that uh, we need to reinforce from the great comment that you made around the cash flow affordability, I don't see many investors looking hard at that affordability piece. They look at purchase price. Yet, can I afford to spend the money on the property? That's about as far as they go. Uh, one thing that we do uh, for ourselves and for the investors we help is to use some very sophisticated software to look at every cost in both buying and then holding a property to break it down to how much per week in year one, three, five, 10, 15 beyond, is this property actually going to cost you or put in your pocket, depending on how you've structured it, so that you can actually last the distance and then uh, reap the rewards at the end? Because as you would know, Dom, over 54% of first time investors sell the property within the first five years. And uh, I've seen firsthand that most of them, because they're not paying attention to the finance and they're not paying attention to the cash flow, they suddenly find that they've structured it wrong, they've bought the wrong property in the wrong location with the wrong yields, uh, with the wrong finance, and all of a sudden it's burning a massive hole in their pocket. They throw their hands up in the air, sell the property, walk away from a sensational wealth creation vehicle and, and never actually achieve the results that they uh, got into it in the first place. I've seen this on on a number of different occasions and it's quite sad. It's really sad talking to a you know a young mother with a child, you know, there's dad's off work and doing what he can. They bought a house and apartment, you know, whatever it is, they've put all their money into it. Um, but they didn't account for X, Y, and Z. 
Um, and then they're faced in, with a circumstance where they have to sell the property and selling it, they may not make their money back. They're going backwards. And then they're looking at, well, I have to go on rent. And then the rent is, you know, not much of a, uh, it's not saving them much money anyways. So they're in a net negative position in so many fronts. And it's sad because they've lost their original deposit. And now they're looking at, well, I can't go back into the market for five, 10 years or whatever it is. It's an uphill battle. That's why that first property is so important. Whether it is your own home, your own investment, I'm not going to judge you. You know, I, I can't shoot at anyone else because I've just recently bought my own home. And, you know, it's, it's a different type of investment, if you will, depending if you treat it that way. Um, but Bushy, looking at the current circumstance, I want to just get a sense of how you're seeing the market and what all these interest rate rises have meant for you and um, how you're approaching this current market with your clients. Yeah, that's a, a great question, Dom. Uh, and it's fair to say I absolutely love times like this when there's lots of media-generated uncertainty. It's uh, I've always been a contrarian in the way I approach it. And, you know, you've, we've all heard the Warren Buffett term, you know, be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. Well, there's a lot of fear floating through the uh, sentiment at the moment. And if we sort of look at the the key drivers of any investment, actually, whether it's property or anything else, it's always supply, demand, and increasingly it's the sentiment value because uh, we've all got iPhones and we've, we're getting channeled with fear-driven hysteria every second of the day. And we need to look at things in terms of the macro, the micro, down to the micro level. So we need to sort of uh, adjust those lens. And I'm a, a, a big fan of John Linderman, the uh, very uh, highly credentialed property analyst, and uh, the lens that I'd like to look at property markets and property opportunities is through what he calls the three P's and then applying my own three eyes of growth to that. So the three P's are people, purchasing power and property. And if we break, break those down, people is really about population. It's about where are people moving to into an area and is that having an impact on demand? Purchasing power, which comes back to the, the finance piece that we've already spoken about, is about capacity and affordability. And then the third P is properties. Are there enough properties available to suit the demand in a certain location? Now, uh, we then overlay that with what I call the three eyes of growth. So if you're in the growth phase of your investment journey where you're accumulating and, and looking to build uh, your nest egg uh, to the level it needs to then be rationalized to give you the cash flow, then there are three key drivers that are more important than ever now, given the, the massive uplift in property values that happened post-COVID. And those three eyes are new infrastructure, new industry, and strong and growing incomes. So uh, if we apply those to what's happening in the market now, uh, then from the supply side, we're seeing extremely tight rental vacancies pretty much across the board, and we're seeing rents rising accordingly. There's very limited stock for sale. Uh, you know, the, uh, if you look at, in most areas of the country at the moment, we're about 40% down on what the, the long-term average of uh, properties for sale is. And we've got a very troubled construction sector. So less properties being built and less properties likely to be built in the foreseeable future. Now, you know, depending on who you listen to and where you get your information, we're, we're somewhere between 150 and 300 odd thousand uh, properties short of what we need to be supplying the demand right now. Now, if you flip the table and you look at the demand side, uh, where we're looking at uh, buying capacity and, and property purchase challenges that are coming out of that due to these finance restrictions. And, you know, we, we've seen a 30 to 35% reduction in buying capacity over the last 12 months. But on the flip side of that, we're seeing massive population growth. So 400,000 last year, 400,000 this year, it drops down to 300,000 and then 250,000 years uh, beyond that. Well, that's producing very strong rental yields, uh, which means that that's uh, improving the cash flow affordability. So if we bring that all together, what that's telling us is that we need to be looking for areas and buyers where people are moving, where they've got good purchasing power and there's limited supply. Now, if you bring those three together in terms of the opportunity that's flowing out of that, I think the the sleeper that a lot of people are, are not getting their heads around at the moment 
are cashed up boomers downsizing to coastal regional hubs that are close to the cities. From the cash flow perspective, so that's, that's the growth opportunities that I think we're seeing. From the cash flow perspective, though, Dom, it's because we're getting such an influx, an influx of skilled migrants, and most of them tend to initially rent for a couple of years, and they tend to land in the major cities. Then from cash flow opportunities, it's, it's apartments in cities where skilled migrants are needing to rent. And that's, that's Melbourne and Brisbane in particular, and to a lesser degree, Sydney. So uh, that's what the market's telling us, and that's where we're focusing our attention at the moment. Really, really good insights there. There's so much to pick apart because... I have the same philosophy. I call it pies, population investments and, you know, economic development and supply. Yeah. But um, what you're talking about there is a few key factors that are, are vitally important. And you're following, you're what, following the flow of people and monitoring the incoming supply. That's the fundamentals that moves it all. Yeah. And you've pinpointed two specific opportunities, which, again, I agree with. We're looking at the largest intergenerational wealth transfer ever. We've got boomers that are coming out of large homes. They're selling them and they've got huge amounts of cash that they're now downsizing into different styles of property. Um, but then also some of them are literally passing the money on to the next generation. And it's interesting to follow that flow of money to say, well, where are they going to go? What type of property are they after? I've spoken about this on other podcasts. Yeah. And then also following the flow of migrants into the country. Um, it's not a surprise. Australia has gone through many waves of migrants and they, we stick together. You know, you like to stick around with like-minded people. There was the Italians, the Greeks, the Chinese, you know, there's every, the, the, there's a lot of Poms, there's Indians. It's, it's, it's happening in waves and it makes sense to stay around your community groups People come into areas where they want to, um, where they can earn a good income. We rent for a while. I think it's about 15% of new inbound migrants actually purchase, which is surprising. Yeah. Um, and then they go and buy something when they can afford it. But yeah. if I'm going to pinpoint you a little bit, little bit more, you said the opportunities are for uh, coastal towns just outside of city centers. And yeah. then also looking at Melbourne, Brisbane, inner city, yeah. Um, what locations do you like? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I, I, I've got to, I guess, uh, state my uh, thoughts around forecasts, uh, Dom. Yeah. Because, uh, again, I'm a big fan of the world's greatest living investor, Warren Buffett. And he's he said for years that uh, uh, forecasts are there to try and make fortune tellers look good. And uh, I reckon he's right because the the accuracy and the re reliability of forecasts is pretty average because, as you know, uh, property conditions have more combinations than a Rubik's Cube, which is about 48 quid, quid trillion, I think, uh, in the context of it. But if we, if we look at those major drivers that you and I have just spoken about, and again, I, I tend to rely on proven analysts who are supporting their uh, information with hard data. And, and the best one that I've found, in addition to all the normal exercises, is John Linderman. Uh, his, his team, Property Power and Partners, have actually got a 90% success rate in their predictions over the last 12 years since he's been doing this work. So uh, if we break it down, uh, the I'll, I'll give you some of the areas regionally because that's that's easy to, to locate. And again, we're talking about the cashed up boomer downsizes that are, that are, are moving to regional coastal lifestyle and recreation hubs. Mm -hmm. So in the Queensland vicinity, the, the areas are going to continue to do really well because of that demand are the areas like Harvey Bay, Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast. Uh, in northern New South Wales is also going to benefit from that. The southern coastal cities uh, as well in New South Wales. In Victoria, it's East Gippsland where there's there's a great opportunity for price uplift. And in South Australia, which has sort of been the the uh, silent performer over the last 12 months, uh, there's three great peninsulas in South Australia that are going to benefit from the cashed up boomers. And that's the Flurio in particular with the wine region and the York and Air Peninsula as well because they're coming off very affordable, low cost bases. Uh, they're only about an hour from the city. 
Uh, so they're all going to benefit uh, significantly from that. And the, the other thing that's worth mentioning in those sorts of destinations that I'm talking about is that they're also very popular holiday and tourist destinations. So they actually offer high cash flow from short-term rental opportunities at the same time. So, you know, as you know, uh, well and truly, Dom, uh, about 70% of property purchases are owner-occupiers. Uh, and the, the real benefit of being an investor, being in the 30%, is all we need to do is slipstream on the emotion of uh, those investors who are buying with their hearts, not their heads, and and locate those properties alongside what they're doing, and we can do very well. And and the the real opportunity, because we're seeing such uh, big constraints around the financing piece at the moment, you know, a lot, we're seeing a lot of investors who are just rocking, coming back to and say we want to buy another property, and you run the numbers for them. So I'm sorry, the interest rate rises have knocked you out. What's good about boomers is they're cashed up. They're not borrowing money at all. They're actually downsizing and using cash to secure property. So it's, there's no limitations on them. And, and that's where we want to be slipstreaming in behind in terms of uh, securing properties and locations that are going to enjoy the, the rise as a consequence of that. Great strategy. Really like it. Which which leads me on to my, my next question. Um, I was going to ask you about what do you think about 2024, but it kind of it's kind of irrelevant, really. And I think a more interesting I, question. No, for I, me, I, I, I'll tell you what I think about 2024 very very briefly. Okay, yeah, uh, go for it. And again, uh, I, I've been talking to John Lindeman, uh, Lindeman personally a fair bit in recent times. If we again, if we look back through history since 1901, there's only been five times where property prices have actually boomed. And when I was, when when we mean boom, that's growth of at least 15% growth in a year. We had one just recently post pandemic. Uh, and each time that this has occurred, there's been massive increases in population, which is accompanied by uh, a real shortage of properties. Now that's exactly where we're at right now. So there's a wave of new immigrants coming in. It's a, a, an absolute flood coming in. So uh, here's a bit of a uh, prediction and, a, and again uh, this is crystal balling so uh, a lot of dynamics come to it but i think by the middle of next year th those locations that we've been talking about are going to be in the the heart of the next boom it's a good prediction and i i actually agree with you um i agree with you because it's just simple supply so supply and demand dynamics and I'm a lot, I'm on social media everywhere and there's a lot of armchair experts that will expound about, you know, interest rates going up mean property prices can't go any further, recession's coming, blah, blah, blah. But in a way, it's kind of irrelevant because we're not talking about a pure investment. It's a, it's a home. Yep. People need to live somewhere, somewhere. They need a house. And at a point... Um, even if prices increase to a point, what happens is there's urban sprawl, you know, and it'll reach a price cap for a location and then people will move out. And this is, there's only so much you can say on social media and it's a long form that really elaborates on that, that, that um, explanation. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing price growth in inner city locations spiking 10, 15, 20, 30%. And then that keeps on sprawling outward. Yeah. And again, what we're seeing is price growth in real estate in key markets that are what we would call uh, blue chip. And blue chip is sort of defined by low levels of sales in that market, people that have a high level of ownership, there's not a lot of debt. So the area that I just recently purchased in, I think it's like 40% of the people that own property there have zero debt. And then um, the rest is, you know, some of them have mortgages and then there's a small rental market. So it's a very tightly held suburb. There's not a lot of sales. I think it's like 100, 150 a year. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Cheap locations, you know. Perfect. And and, and you're, you're reading that spot on, Dom, because in times when it's difficult to get a hands on money, invest in areas where people are buying that don't have to borrow money at all. And, and, and that's scarcely held suburbs like you've just described. And, and given that people aren't really getting their head around the massive number of cashed up boomers that are flowing through, the next 10 years is going to be dominated in property by uh, the movement of the boomers. There's no the question about the it. There's, and, and there's about a third of our population that are uh, 55 years and older, Dom. So, uh, and they're most of them uh, that are going to drive what we're talking about are in very good financial positions. So uh, that's that's the good oil and where to focus your energy, I think. 
Um, that's a good shout out. So what's your what's your investment philosophy when it comes to real estate? Everyone has a, I don't want to ask you what the best way is, but what's your philosophy when it comes to real estate investing? Yeah, let, let me walk you through this because there's a, there's a little bit to this, Dom. Uh, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is I have always started with the end in mind. I used to be an architect, so I was always visualizing exactly how something was going to be and then working out how to get there. And I, I call it living by design now. That That's the philosophy that, uh, that we adopt. It's what I've documented in my book, The Freedom Formula, because for me, it's actually all about time. It's not about money. It's about time, time to do the things that are important to me. So the, the first thing that I take into account with that is that whatever I'm investing in, I don't create a second job when I'm doing it because I actually want to get my time back the other way. And I, I also adopt what I call a wealth by stealth approach. So that's about being borderless and it's about being long-term. And if I was to sum up the philosophy in a nutshell, it's just using as little of my own money to secure as big an asset value as possible, as quickly as possible, and make it as affordable as possible, and then use time, the tenant, and the tax office together with capital growth to do all the lifting work. Now, if I was to sum, summarize that all, I, I would say I'm a what I call a passive aggressive investor. It's about becoming aggressive about creating passive residual income. And everything we've invested in for a long time now, Dom, has been built around three key criteria. Uh, and whether that's property, shares, our businesses, it's a, it, it must create residual income, it must grow on value, and it must be saleable. Now, the other thing that I want to mention around the, the strategy piece for us, and this is quite different to what a lot of investors I see, is we take what I call a top-down scarcity approach. So we determine uh, if, we, if we're in the growth phase, so when we started our journey, it was all about growth. And then as we, as we projected our nest egg was going to reach the level it needed to be to create the uh, income, we then converted to cash flow. So I talk about the capital growth to cash flow curve. But during the accumulation stage, which is where most Australian investors are in the property sphere, it's about determining what your achievable and affordable spend is. So do the numbers on the affordability piece. Uh, and then if you're in the growth phase, buy real houses for real people in tightly held suburbs, uh, just like you've just done yourself, whether you're buying a home or an investment property. And then uh, look at the 15 uh, of 1,000 suburbs and nearly 11 million property locations and or build them across the country to satisfy that rather than uh, chase hotspots. Because I, you know, there's a lot of hotspotters out there uh, that will just hear about a location, buy whatever they can afford. And if they can only buy a unit, that's what they buy. What they don't realise is that a unit's not going to enjoy anywhere near the growth that a real home, a three or four bedroom home on a block of dirt is going to achieve and they don't end up achieving their goals. So, so you know, if we would break that down, if it's if it's top down, uh, start with the end in mind, work out how you want to live, what sort of nest egg you need, because that will dictate the strategy. If you're in growth, it's three or four bedroom homes in tightly held areas and apply those three eyes of infrastructure, income and industry to it. If it's cash flow, uh, the, and you're rationalising into that tax-effective cash flow. It's it's more into higher yielding opportunities like units, apartments, and commercial property. So, and the other thing I, I need to mention here, uh, which is going probably a bit different from a lot of investors, I'm a big fan of new build properties, and uh, and I'm not talking about new build properties in uh, greenfield areas where there's unlimited acres of land to be developed. I'm talking about uh, building good quality homes in tightly held areas that have all of those three eyes attached to it because there's some significant advantages from that cash flow affordability perspective uh, due to uh, much reduced stamp duty costs, but also the full suite of depreciation benefits that are still applied to new build properties that make them much more affordable to hold long term. So that's pretty much the the key aspects uh, of my own personal investment philosophy. Don? There's a lot to unpack in there. And in my mind, it's all, you know, it, it's all really good lessons and advice in there. And what I pick out of that is it really is tailored in many ways, as in depending on where you are, what your budget is, how old you are, what you're trying to achieve. There are a number of different types of investments that are suitable to you. 
But I also like the fact that you've identified the type of investor that you are. You're passive aggressive. Um, you know, there are a number of ways to make money in real estate. And what I chat about in my book is that profit and pain curve. And what I found is the more pain you're happy to undergo, typically the more profit you're, you'll be able to chase down. Um, the more passive it is and the less pain you have in there, pain comes in a number of ways. It can be the time it takes for the investment to mature. Pain is the time that it takes for you to actually actively get in there. The experience that's required, the learning curve, the amount of cash, that's all more pain. The more cash you need to put into the investment, that's way more painful than something that's a minimal deposit. Yeah. So if you're going to have a look at that, the, the biggest and best way to make the most amount of money is to develop real estate, but that's a career. And you have to ask yourself, do I want to be a developer or do I want to be a doctor, a, you know, a mortgage broker, a painter, whatever else? And that's okay because from developing, then you can scale all the way back to a whole uh, myriad of other options. And as you said, I like a passive aggressive approach and that's what I used for the first four or five properties that I did. It's pick good quality investments in high quality locations and then let the market do the lifting for me and then rely on, as you said, the the tax man, the tenant. And what was the last T? Yeah, the <laughs> the tenant, the tax man and the, the time. The, the, the time. Three, three key T's. But that's something that, that is worth, and it, you know, sort of... Uh, Drawing the dots between what you've just shared with us, which which is which is awesome. One of the things that I often talk to investors about is what you invest in and how you invest needs to be driven not only by how much money uh, you can afford to put into it, but how much time have you got to actually manage that investment. Now, if you're a career focused and you've got a busy family uh, and you're spending all of your spare time taxing your kids around the sport on the weekends and, and working nights to make things happen uh, in your career, then uh, you're putting yourself at high risk if you dive into property development. You're better off if you're time poor to look at longer term exercise with low risk so that you know, you're sort of developing uh, your passive uh, wealth in parallel with your career. Uh, if you're wanting to make a career out of it and you and you want to dedicate a lot of time, but you've also got the horsepower to support it. So a, a lot of people uh, forget that if you jump ship and you don't have that safe uh, income flowing through, the banks aren't going to give you any money to actually make it happen anyway. So there's a fine balance here between uh, your capacity from an equity and a borrowing capacity perspective, but that time piece, I keep talking about time ad infinitum because if you don't have time, uh, then don't overextend yourself because you get yourself into trouble. I was just saying to you earlier, I was sick for the past week and it's a function of stress and over overextending myself, I have to say, and I have a bad habit of doing that. People that know I'm probably laughing right now, not at my expense, hopefully. <laughs> but um, look, I, I completely agree. And I, I actually like the fact that you do um, advocate for new real estate. There's a lot of naysayers and I understand why people don't like new real estate. There are some uh, shocking examples of new builds that are terrible, um, that they've built, been built very poorly. But there are some really, really good examples of new builds that, you know, the most sophisticated investors in the world, BlackRock is the biggest uh, re, uh, investor in the world. They're turning their attention to multifam, multi-resi uh, developments, yeah. buying buildings, building apartments. They, the, the tax man helps them, the tenant helps them, the depreciation helps them. Um, and if the most sophisticated investors in the world are looking at multifamily homes, there's something to be said there. They're not buying old shitty things and develop. They're, just, they're buying a building and letting it out. And there's something to be said there. Yeah, and then the build build to rent phenomenon is about to sweep across Australia. There's a, there's a lot of government incentives coming into that area to do exactly that. That's going to be our version of multi multi home. Uh, the, the one thing I would say though uh, to to underscore the. Uh, the building side of the equation is that I've been sitting out of that space for the last couple of years because unless I can guarantee uh, time, quality and cost, then uh, it's high risk. Now, the industry, the construction industry is still uh, working its way through a pretty challenged time. We, you know, there wouldn't be a week goes by where there's not an, another story of a major builder going bust. 
Uh, and I think there's a four corners showing up this week around the, exactly the same subject. But once it settles down, it's not too far away where you can actually get back to fixed price contracts with fixed delivery times uh, where the builder's accepting the risk uh, if there's any blowouts then uh, building is a really good vehicle to do it. So I, I, I don't think we're too far. I might be, might be six to 12 months away What before I think it's worth uh, dipping the toe back into that pond. Completely agree. We're taking a little break from building. I've, I'm I'm building different things. And in each time I'm building one thing or another, it, it's tough. It's really tough out there. Now, Bushy, I wanna, I'm just conscious of time. So I want to ask you a couple more questions. Um, I've labeled this LFYP. It's a lesson for young players. Players being people playing life and trying to have a crack. Um, tell us about a time where you've made a mistake in your life that informed all of your decisions going forward. Yeah, uh, there's one major one, mate, because my life's been in two halves. I call it BC and AD. And that, it was before the crisis and after the divorce. It's pretty much how I've lived my life. Because before I was following the Australian dream, I was an architect, I was working on great jobs, I was, I was pouring money into super, I had a nice home and I was going to tick off the, the uh, bucket list when I retired. Well, I burnt myself out, mate. Uh, I ended up burnt out, broken and broke at the tender age of 33. And that was a major wake up call for me. So I, I pretty much uh, took two years out. I call it my Howard Hughes years, mate, where I just uh, hid myself while I did my master's in business because that was an excuse. What I was actually doing was readjusting my headset uh, to make sure that I was approaching life the right way. And I, about the same time, I uh, got dragged along to a Robert Kiyosaki uh, conference. He was actually live in Adelaide at that, at, this was back in the uh, late 90s. That's where the passive aggressive exercise came through. Uh, and that's where those three, everything I've done since that point, uh, as I say, must have a residual income, must grow in value and must be saleable. So our businesses have been that way. Uh, everything we've done uh, since that point in time has been driven around that. And I encourage people to start thinking, uh, developing that parallel perspective. So just don't focus on your job. Don't assume that your job is going to be everything and everything to your life because if you're working for someone else, that can that can be wiped out in a second, in a heartbeat. So you make sure that you're becoming the worker and the wealth builder and putting energy and time into it and surrounding yourself with a team that's actually actively making that happen. And then you're just managing those managers to put yourself in a position where you're going to secure and attain and maintain your lifestyle long-term. I'm going to be annoying. Can you tell us about a specific story or a time? Is, if you were to think back to a moment or a crisis, it doesn't have to be that bad, but just something where it hurt and you thought, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, my very first development, I, if it, we you don't make it a, a property-specific exercise, Dom, my very first uh, entree into the property area, I, I, I started life as a rent vest and was a, was a rent vester for a long time. But but pre the divorce, this is this was back when I was, I think I was about 23, 24. Uh, I was an architect in Alice Springs at the time. And uh, we'd been doing a lot of work with a developer builder. We decided, uh, myself and two architects, uh, uh, partners and this builder decided to do a one in four uh, redevelopment. So we bought an old place on the east side of Alice Springs. We bolted over and built these four beautiful apartments, mate. They were absolutely stunning. Uh, and, and we did everything wrong you possibly could, Dom. Uh, we, one, spent way too much on properties that were never going to sell. We thought, oh, these are going to be so good that people just fall over themselves to buy them. Mistake number one. Uh, mistake number two, uh, we weren't building to the market. So we weren't creating properties that the uh, market was actually happy to pay for. So, so we completely outpriced ourselves. That meant we were stuck with the properties at the end. Uh, and, you know, the, the rental income, we ended up putting tenants in them and uh, rent was way short. So they were negatively geared big time and burning a massive hole in our pocket. We didn't have a agreement amongst ourselves about the what ifs. So there, there was no shareholders agreement or prenup, which which I've, I've instituted ever since that point in time, whenever I'm doing anything with anyone else. And one of those parties got divorced. The other one had to fire sale it. Mate, uh, it was the worst experience you could ever uh 
put into the property. I reckon I made every mistake he can make in that exercise. And that really flipped my lid into starting with the basics and getting back to the passive aggressive approach of recognizing that if I bought a quality asset in a tightly held area that had the three eyes of growth attached to it and pretty much set and forget, uh, that was going to be a better road to uh, financial freedom than trying to uh, create an empire in a day and get rich quick. That is a beautiful story. I hate to smile at your expense, but God, they're the best ones. The 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 those lessons that you walk away from a just a shocking experience where you walk in thinking you're king shit. You think you've got all the answers, and it's all with the best of intent. But you walk away with your your tail between your legs, and you think, "Fuck, I did my ass on that one," and you can't afford to, to find truth in that issue and find what i'm not going to walk away from this thing having just lost money i'm going to walk away with some gold and these are the lessons and if i can feel the lessons you learn you know build to the market you know uh you know making sure you've got agreements that are in place you know don't overspect the thing it's there's so much in there that's valuable that become transformative for a young bloke like the the 24 year old man that you were to the man that you are today, right? Yeah, it was. I, I knew enough to be dangerous, and I didn't <laughs> know what I didn't know, Dom. That that's that was, and and the ego got in the way of good sense. So uh, it was a massive learning curve. That uh, really, but but here's the thing, uh, and and this is what I would I would say to everyone: just like learning to walk, you, if you fall over, you just don't give up on walking. You just get keep getting up, but you're doing it differently every time, and eventually you're going to master what works for you. Because if you said, as you said at the outset, there's no one road uh, to property. There's no silver bullet. It's what's right for you and your situation, and your circumstance, and your sleep at night factor at that time, and it will change. So it's not a one size fits all strategy you adopt for the rest of your life. As you progress through your journey and your knowledge and familiarity and comfort level grows, then you'll start doing different and other things that are eventually going to get you to where you want to, which for me is giving us a residual income that now allows us the, the time and privilege of spending time talking to you and, and helping others along that journey. Really good advice. And um, that steps that comes to my next question. And this is a shameless plug for my book. You won't fuck it up. Um, what advice would you give to new investors or homeowners so they don't fuck up their next purchase? Yeah. Number one, uh, whether you're a homeowner or a property investor, every property is an investment. So don't, don't think that you're a homeowner. It doesn't count because it does. Because every property that you secure for whatever purpose must be investment grade and it must have owner occupier appeal. At some point, you're going to sell that property. And if you're just buying an investment grade property, thinking you're going to sell it to investors, you're missing out on 70% of the buying market. So that, that's number one. Number two, start with the end in mind. Know your numbers before you start. Build it all on paper first before you even start thinking about the property. Third, make sure that you're very clear on where you want to end up and, and therefore what sort of lifestyle are going to live, what that lifestyle costs, because that'll tell you the nest egg that you need. Now, I, I call it the freedom numbers. We do freedom number uh, estimates for all of our clients as the very first thing. How do you want to live? How much does that cost? What's the nest egg? Uh, if you do nothing, where are you going to end up? What's the gap? And then what's your capacity to fill that gap? Because that will determine what sort of strategy and what sort of properties you end up buying. So make sure you do that. And if, if any of your listeners want some help on that, then uh, with the freedom forecast that we produce, we'd be happy to uh, assist people on that exercise. The third thing, coming back to what we said at the start, property is a game of finance. So apply the bare facts. And what are the bare facts? I'm talking about the grizzly bear, borrowings, equity, affordability, and risk. Get really clear on exactly how those things operate because that will determine what your actual achievable and affordable purchase price power is. And then once you know that, find the highest growth location around the, the country that's going to satisfy that. So they're pretty much the, the key things that I would start. But the property is the last thing that you look at, not the first. So uh, we all love to get sexy and, and scroll through the uh, websites to look at uh, properties and get excited about that. But if you haven't got everything else in, in line first, you're bound to make mistakes. Oh, you've given it all the way, Bushy. 
<laughs> it feels it feels like we've, this is um, a masterclass in buying real estate and finance. There's so much to consider. I want to thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Um, it's, it's good to catch up with like-minded professionals that are out there doing their best, trying to help the people around them. And it's good talking to someone that's achieved many of the things that they're talking about because you don't want to get advice from an idiot that hasn't done the things that you're trying to achieve. You know what I'm trying to say? I do, mate. And believe you me, I've made a lot of mistakes along that journey. Yeah. Uh, and, and mistakes are good because that's where your biggest learnings come from. But I, like yourself, Dom, I, I'm very humbled and honoured to join you on the show. I'm looking forward to getting you on the Realty Talk Show before long to expand on, on some of these subjects that I know of interest to uh, uh, property owners, buyers and investors out there. So I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today, mate. Thank you very much. And um, to all of you out there, I hope you enjoyed the show. Happy investing, happy house hunting, and we'll catch you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red hot property investing news and insights, direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge and I look forward to seeing you next time.